Um, so we are a statewide nonprofit. Uh, we work to make trash obsolete, and we do this primarily through helping pass laws at the city, the county, the state, and now some federal efforts. And then we do research projects and we do community-based projects. I'm not gonna talk about all of these areas that we work on today, but you can kind of see them laid out here. But I do wanna to bring to your attention um, the top left-hand corner, producer responsibility is where the manufacturers pay for the end of life of products. So in this case, we were part of a very large effort, many partners, to pass an e-waste law in about 10, 11 years ago, so that if you have a leftover computer or a device um, that you want that you're not, no longer want to use and or maybe broken, you can take it back to Goodwill. They are paid by HP and Microsoft and um, Dell and all of them to recycle to either to, to take it and then to either put it on the shelf or to recycle it through um, local uh, efforts in Washington state. Another example is um, a bill that was passed in 2018. It took 10 years, hundreds and hundreds of people to get this passed. It was um, championed by Rep. Strom Peterson and it was the first in the nation's Secure Drug Take Back Act. This was um, a, a producer responsibility where um, the manufacturers will pay for the safe disposal of your leftover medicine and it went into effect in November. So if you have leftover medicines, you can take them to a pharmacy, uh, the um, sheriff's office or the hospital and you have to look online and see where your, your nearest locations are paid for by the manufacturers. So we're super happy with that. Another law that um, passed several years ago and now is going to go into effect in a few weeks, April 1. If you have leftover paint, hang on to it because you will be able to take it in um, to hardware stores and it's through Paint Care is the name of the program. And you can, um, latex paint is very, very recyclable um, right into other paint. And then um, latex paint, good quality paint. And the oil-based paints are not recyclable, but they'll put, if it's in good shape, they'll put it up on the shelf and they'll, they'll have people get it for free to reuse it or it'll be treated as hazardous material. Um, so today I'm going to talk, I'm going to start talking about the plastics and recycling crisis as well as food waste, um, legislative action and other solutions. So let's start with plastics. Um, so um, this is from the United Nations that, that they have from current data that by 2025 in our oceans, we will have one pound of plastic for every three pounds of biomass in our oceans. This is the rate at which plastics are going in right now. And 2025 is just around the corner, unfortunately. Um, we live in a plastic era. This is a graph from 1950 to 2015 showing the use of plastic in um, all different sectors around the whole world. And you can see the 2007 recession shows up in this graph. That shows how keyed plastics is to our economy. So when this thing is drawn out past 2020, we're gonna see the, the, the COVID impact as well in this graph. Um, the, the blue at the bottom is packaging. So over 30% of the plastic resin that is used around the world is for packaging. And it's a very, very broad category. Everything from bottles to bags, to the sticker on your veggie, to um, the wrap around your toilet paper, to a candy wrapper. Those are all packaging. And this is what we can do something about. We're not so much worried about you know, your glasses. My glasses are made of plastic. Those are durables. It's the stuff you use for a few minutes and then dispose of. That's the stuff that we feel like you can really tackle. And I would like to add that Surfrider and Resources are big, big efforts on them, big, big partners on this. Um, so right now, it, the amount of plastic going in is about two garbage trucks per minute. And if nothing changes, we're going to basically be at the point of triple the amount of plastic in the ocean by 2040 going in. So that is, that is the challenge we have. Um, and then of course, we're very concerned about plastics in the food chain. Microsoft, uh, microplastics have been found at every depth um, in all the way down to the Marianas Trench, they found an entire plastic bag down there, um, all the way up to the poles, and um, and in over 660 species. And then plastics themselves are made of oil and gas. They are themselves toxic, and then there are additives that are put in. So, in terms of um, issues with plastics besides wildlife, one big issue is the impact on our commercial compost facilities. So, this is a facility in Washington. Um, your material from your um, blue bin, I mean, sorry, not your blue bin, your green bin, would go to the shed, would get chopped up a little bit and go into these long windrows and be um, basically covered and have um, air, I think it's not oxygen, I think it's air, injected in them for 90 days. 
and then they turn it and do another 90 days and they create a very, very luscious soil, you know, compost, uh, soil amendment compost. That steam is right, I took this photo in the morning, so that is steam rising off of fresh compost. If you look at that very pile up close, this is what it looks like, and this is what it's full of. It is full of plastic, and they, they try really hard to get it out, but they really can't. People are confused. They think that you can put your, your yard waste in plastic bags, mm, not good. And also um, that people can, um, uh, that they're gonna pick it out, which they don't really have the capacity to do. They can kind of screen it out and they can do things, but it's, it's gonna, there's a lot of plastic, including a lot of things like plastic utensils as well. So another major impact that I'm sure you all are keenly aware of is that we have a lot more litter that is showing up in our public places, along waterways, along the highways. And a large part of that is because our population has grown, but also because the nature of our um, litter has dramatically changed um, from things that were like metal and paper to more plastic, and that doesn't degrade um, in, in the environment. And then, of course, we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up our, uh, I'm sorry, to restore salmon and um, to put in green infrastructure. And then the problem is this litter clogs it, causing flooding for infrastructure and then also causing um, problems so that things don't function correctly for the salmon and it costs the municipalities a ton of money to clean it up. Now with COVID, what we have seen is a lot more of the impact of, of uh, sort of exposed to the public, how much waste there is in the medical system. And in particular, the very visceral thing that people are seeing is all the masks um, and other gloves. If you walk around any roadway, I mean, you see all this stuff is being dumped, which is really terrible. Um, so this has all been kind of exposed by COVID through the last um, year, year. Now, I wanna draw your attention to this terrific report that came out last year from As You Sow. This is their slide. Um, it's a report where they looked at the um, international, wait, was it international? Yeah, international corporations, um, the big ones, and they looked at their, um, they, they assessed them on six pillars of sustainable pa plastic packaging things. So the first is design, packaging design, reusable packaging, which of course we really, really wanna get a reuse now, um, how much recycled content they're using, how much transparency they have about what they are doing, um, how much they're supporting recycling and whether they support producer responsibility. Here's the report card. And it is terrible. It's a bad report card. It's not something you want to have on yours. There is no A's, zero A's. The highest thing is Unilever with a B minus. And so yay, Unilever, that's, that's really, really great. But you can see all the rest of the companies have quite a long ways to go on these, um, on these, on these metrics. So that I, I commend that report to you. It's a very cool report. Okay, so let's talk about the recycling crisis. Right now we have a recycling crisis in the world and it's because it was exposed and kind of came to a head because China said, no more. We will no longer take the waste of the world. And that was a couple of years ago. And the deal in the Pacific Northwest is that up to 60% of our waste was going to China and Southeast Asia. And these are bales of, um, in this case, plastic bottles, but um, the bales of materials, they, they said no to a whole slew of different types of material. The, um, the situation is that we, the port of Seattle is um, a dead head port in this regard. What that means is, is that containers would come to the port of Seattle full of goods that are either sold here or put on rail and go to Chicago in the Midwest. And then they were going home largely empty because we have airplanes that fly off. We have grains that go in grain type of tanker type things. We have oil because of tanker type things. We just don't actually make that many things that go into containers that go back to the Southeast Asia area. So what happened is, is it was cheaper to send a bale of, 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 of recyclable to China via a container ship that, from Seattle than to take that same bale and ship it from Seattle to Portland, Oregon. That's the dynamic that we had. So think of the greenhouse gas implications of that. Um, what they did is they banned 24 different commodities and they initially said that they would only allow 0.03% contamination in the bales. They, they upped it to 0.05, but 
But the reality is that's essentially zero. That's not a typo there. It's basically saying 0% practically, which means you can virtually have nothing in a bale that's not the correct thing in there. And they also restricted the licenses, the import licenses. These, this is a photo of immigration officers in China looking at the bales. And what they used to do is just kind of look at it and bring them in. Then they start with the, with, when this went into effect, they basically would open up the bale and look for anything. And if they saw anything above that standard, they would then send the entire container load and all the containers with it back to where it came from. So this effectively put a, almost a halt, not entirely, but almost a halt to being able to send things to China. And then other countries took it, but then they started to close down as well. So um, why did China do this? The reason China did this was to both clean up their own environment and also to build their own um, circular economy. There's this, this is a terrific film called Plastic China. You can watch a three minute trailer of it online and get and have your heart wrenched. Um, it, what happened is, is the bales were going into China and they were either going to factories or they were really going to a ton of little mom and pop operations all around the country where people would pull out the things they could sell, but if there was things in there that weren't supposed to be in the bale, they would then burn or, or um, dump those things. So this was a huge, huge human health issue. And this is, for example, um, the, so they actually have now renamed their initiative China Blue Sky. And, the, and this is an example here. This is Beijing looking from the CNN tower over the city um, on a day of a parade, a military parade. And then um, three days later after they stopped, um, the, so they stopped the industry, had the blue sky, and then they went back to the normal. So this is the thing in China is they have so much industry that they are really now working very hard on trying to clean up their environment. This is a good thing. We like this because A, they're cleaning up their environment and B, they're, they're, they're giving us a reckoning so that we can actually address our recycling and do a way better job of waste reduction here in the Pacific Northwest. So here is a photo of a recycling facility. Um, this is called a MRF, Material Recovery Facility. And the first thing you do when you have the material come in um, is they dump it. It's like a big building with a bunch of conveyor belts and, and optical sorters and gravity sorters and, and air blowers and all sorts of things. It's a very cool thing to go see a MRF. And we do a tour once a year if you guys wanna come and come on one, one of the tours we organize. Um, so um, what they're doing is they're sorting primarily round things or three-dimensional things from flat things. And that's kind of one of the primary things they're trying to do to get the paper and things like that separated from the round things like the containers. But the thing is, is that as the trucks come around in the neighborhoods, what they're doing is they're putting your recyclables into their truck and then they're crushing it. And that's because they're trying to get 30% more material in the trucks, which is a good thing because then there's less greenhouse gases and there's less truck traffic. So you want them to crush things, but crushing things means that things become like paper. So this is a, a mixed paper bale um, that I took photos of um, uh, in a paper mill. And so these had come to a paper mill. And so you can see that this bale, although it's a little bit um, beat up here, you can see that it looks like it's mostly paper, right? Well, up close, look at what's in there. See the, 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 see the, uh, the, the lid there? And here's what else is in there. See the plastic bag? And if you look closely all around, you could actually see there was a lot of plastic in there because it got kind of treated as paper in the MRF situation. So people ask, okay, we have a recycling crisis, but what does that mean in terms of, of the value of these materials? So some things have actually done okay. Um, so uh, aluminum cans, uh, glass, um, HDPE, uh, the number two um, milk jugs and, and bottles, and then um, number one, which is like your soda bottles and things. Those have done more or less okay, and they've had some ups and downs, but the paper went down it was valued um, before China did their initiative. It was valued at over $100 a ton. And then it went down to, it kept going down. And then about a year later, it went down to negative $35 a ton. In other words, they were paying the paper mills to take it essentially with the transportation costs. And now it's starting to come back up again. The paper was the economic driver for the recycling system. It was the bulk of the material there and it was the bulk of the, the money that would come. So um, that's how we ended up in this recycling crisis. So let me, um, I'll keep going and then I'll wait for, I'll go for questions in a sec. Okay, so in Washington state, this shows you the cost per household of um, the recycling at the residential level in the unincorporated areas. It's called the UTC regulated areas. It's the um, utilities and transportation commission areas 
um, which are regulated differently than some of the other areas like the city, some of the cities. And this just this is just to give you an idea. The price of recycling per household has gone up 36% since 2015, but yet what you can actually recycle has not gone up because of all these other things I just mentioned a moment ago. And the other thing is, and this is very sad, is that we were kind of on a trajectory to get to some really good recycling rates in recovery rates, which includes a little bit of incineration, um, by, uh, um, and we got up to 56.6, and we're now down to 48.5. So it's really not cool that our recycling rate has gone down. And that again is all these factors I just mentioned. And people say, well, how valuable is it to recycle? And this is, I think it's 2019 data. This is a terrific organization, ISRE, ISRI, um, who tracks this sort of thing. And this shows you the energy saving if you use a recycled material versus virgin. And you can really see how, what a stark thing this is. I mean, look at the cans at the top. That's a pretty amazing thing. But plastic is really good too. So we really should recycle it from an environment, from an energy perspective. Um, okay, now I'm gonna turn to, food. I'm gonna stop in a minute and go for questions, but I'm just gonna do one last piece, which is the food piece. So Washington does every five years, a terrific report. It's the, called the Waste Characterization report, Study. And they, it was done by Cascadia Consulting and they did it in 2015 and published it in 2016. And they're now doing one now for 2020, they do it every five years. So 2020, which will be the COVID years, that'll be interesting to see what that shows. Um, and they do all sectors and they do different times a year. It's a really, really terrific study of the material going to the landfill, not recycling, not compost. This is the material going to the landfill. So here's their graph, their chart. And you can see that the largest amount of material by weight is organic material, 28.5%. And um, this is another graph from another, another chart from their report. Um, this is the top 15 most prevalent items. And I put a box around the food pieces. So they did a very careful distinction between inedible food and edible food. And you can look in their appendix and see how they defined it, but they did a very careful distinction. And here's the punchline. 17% of what is going to landfill by weight is food. And about half of that is edible food. There is no way we should be sending edible food to the landfill when we have hungry people in our state or the world. And the inedible food for sure should be going to feeding animals or being compost or digested, making energy. I mean, it's just insane that we have any of this going there. We really think we need to tackle this particular problem. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions and then we'll go on with um, the rest of the presentation. Or comments, questions or comments. Yes, folks, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or you can just turn on your camera, turn on your audio. Um, yeah, shout them out. Yes, I have a question. What was the name of that report that you were talking about for the plastic packaging? Yeah, um, the, the one where I was showing the, um, the, the landfill stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the that's Ecology's Waste Characterization Report. Terrific report. If you Google that, you'll get it in two seconds. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, shall I keep going? Anyone else have a thought or comment or Ooh, reaction? Yes, we do have a question. Um, this one. Oh, sorry. Well, let's unmute them and let them talk, ask their question. Oh, they posted it in the chat. Um, it's how is such a, wait. How is such an effective amount of plastics being recycled? I'm not sure I understand the question. You're gonna to have to ask more. <laughs> well, it was it was a, a chart that you showed that had the aluminum as top, and then the second one was plastics. Well, what what is the reality of that? I thought plastics were were not uh, being effective. I understand your question. Yes. Okay. That graph was not saying how many are recycled. What it was saying is if you recycle it, how valuable is it from an, an energy perspective? So, so you're, you're exactly right. Um, worldwide, only about 9% of plastics are recycled, but in Washington, I think we're at about 16 or 17%. So we're better than the worldwide, about 16 to 70% of our plastics are recycled in Washington. Our residential is recycled, uh, but that chart was, um, probably a little confusing, but that was about if you do recycle something, what is the benefit of it rather than using the virgin material? Well, the, the question then still is, how is that being effective? How, 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 wh where is that plastic going to be effective? Um, well, 
um, they are in fact make, using that plastic into making new things. And so that's, who, who is? we're gonna get into recycled content in a minute. So let me show you that. It's all going across the, the Pacific though, isn't it? No, well, okay, in the past, in the past, yes. And now it's being, now there are more facilities being built in North America and the facilities are being expanded in North America. So we do have certain things like PET, which is the number one, which is in fact very desirable. And you can make a bottle, the PET bottle, and then actually turn it into a brand new PET bottle with just a teeny bit of virgin. Mm -hmm. So we do have some good things that are being recycled in very well right now. And, and we're trying to actually enhance that. And you'll see that in a minute in the wall. Okay, the well, I'd be interested in the specifics of that. Thank you. Okay, great. And there's actually a really good report that I didn't have here. And I should, and I usually do. So Ecology, did, and you'll love this because with your question, I think you would love this. Um, so Ecology did a very detailed study of all of our plastic packaging in Washington. And that was published in October. And it goes into great detail about all the different plastics and how they're being recycled and how much there is and things like that. That would probably be a, a, a document you would love to see. So remind me later to try to find the link and give it to you in the chat. Because okay. that would answer your question in, in more detail than you even want to know. <laughs> um, any other questions people have before we move on into legislative? Yes, we do. Judith, Judith had a question. Um, my understanding is there's a single use plastic bag ban in effect in Washington, but I don't see any difference in my grocery store. How is this being enforced? <laughs> what a brilliant question. Okay, so here's the deal. We are so, so pleased that um, after many, many years and a two years in the legislature, Senator Doss's um, plastic bag bill passed last March and was signed by the governor last March, March 2020. It was supposed to go into effect statewide on January 1, just now, but because of COVID and because of supply issues with the bags, it is not going to be going to effect until June 30th at the earliest. And maybe if the COVID um, pandemic is still in place, it might, to the extent that it's impacting supply, then it would go um, some months later. So you're very good question. Basically the bag law at the state level and even the local level are not being enforced. They're real, essentially not in, in place right now. So we hope um, with, you know, soon um, that we will, it, it all go into effect and we will definitely see a huge difference. But right now I would, I would agree with you. You wouldn't see much of a difference. Is there one more question? I think I saw a little flashy thing. Okay, well, let's keep going. And then um, I'm happy, by the way, to answer. If anyone has a question and says, hey, ask, just call out your question as we go. I'm very happy to do that. Okay, um, so let's talk about the legislative session. So as I mentioned, we have sort of two big crises. We have the, the plastics crisis and our recycling crisis, and we also have a food waste crisis. But um, what our strategy is, is to reduce the use of unnecessary plastics and build markets and restore our recycling system, creating jobs in Washington. So um, Senator Doss is leading a bill, 5022, that actually had a hearing this afternoon in the House. It passed out of the Senate and it's now in the House and Liz Berry had a companion bill in the House. And what does this bill do? Well, the first thing it does is it bans expanded polystyrene, um, certain things. It bans certain food service products like clamshells and um, food containers and plates and cups. It bans recreational coolers and it bans packing peanuts. Now, Liz, who's on the line here, could, and probably resources, could say, you know, we see a lot of these recreational coolers or pieces of them on the beaches. And pretty much everyone hates styrofoam peanuts, and, and, and a lot of people have already moved away from those. And the remaining thing, really, that is kind of a bigger deal is the foodware. And the thing about the foodware is that styrene is now listed by, by WHO as a probable carcinogen. They listed that in 2018, and there are remnants of the styrene in the expanded polystyrene when you have, say, a cup of coffee. That cup has remnants of styrene, and it's the, the chemicals migrate into the food in tiny amounts when you have a hot thing or a greasy thing. So we really, really, really feel like this needs to go because of um, that toxic thing, and because they blow around and create a lot of problems in the environment, and because they cause contamination in the recycling stream. They don't like, they, the, the systems here won't pick up curbside. So the next piece of the bill is an ask first piece for the whole state saying that if you're, if you're a restaurant or a food thing or a DoorDash online, you would only give people utensils, straws, cup lids, cold cup lids, 
and, um, and, and condiments if the person wants it. Because how many of you have a drawer in your kitchen that is um, a, a full of plastic forks? I do, I'm sure you all do too. So this is so that you don't, if, it's not to say that they're banned, it's just to say that you don't get it. I'm like, oh, look at that. <laughs> so <laughs> Destiny has the perfect example of what you all probably have too, because no one wants to throw them out, right? So um, then the next piece, and this gets at, at uh, the question from before, is um, about recycled content. So there are three recycled content pieces in this bill. The first one is requires that for beverage containers, this is like Coke bottles, et cetera, that by different years and ultimately by 2031, there has to be 50% post-consumer recycled content for beverage containers. Now the major companies have made all these pledges that they're going to do this. And this is basically very much in line, but it codifies it of what they, um, that they've said. So Naked is already at 100% recycled content. Coke a couple of weeks ago announced that they're gonna be doing 100% recycled content in the United States, but it's not post-consumer. It's just regular old recycled content. We want post-consumer after we use the plastic um, that, that it would go into the materials. The second piece is, um, and this would be first in the nation, is for jugs and bottles for cleaning household, this should say household, household cleaning products and personal care products. Um, and again, a tiered up thing to 50% by 2031. Now I happen, since I was testifying on this today, I happened to, let's see if I can even pull this off right now. I happened to actually do an assessment of my bathroom this morning because um, what I learned in doing a lot of research on this in the last few days, this is my bathroom. These are the shampoos and conditioners that we have lurking in our bathroom. So can't those- see Can't see it, Heather. You can't see it? No. Oh no. I can see it. Your background. Yeah, it's, a, it's my background. Can you see my background? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. So um, I use this for testimony today because what it turns out is that there are seven major mega corporations that man that actually have the almost all of the personal care product brands in the in the U.S. and um, it's like 184 brands that they have. And in fact, I can show that too. I didn't end up showing this today because I I figured I was I was, I was probably pushing the envelope by even doing what I did but I did actually prepare it so I could show it. So here we go. I don't know if you can see this very well, but um, that is, these are the seven brand corporations. Can you guys see that? If you put me on speaker here, yes, I, can, I can see it. Okay, yeah. So those seven brands are the, um, they have 184, 182 of the individual brands that you see when you go to your bathroom. And that is almost everything at the drugstore. And they all, all these major brands like Procter and Gamble, L'Oreal, they all have on their website sustainability pledges and also um, goals and targets that are very much in line with what um, this bill does. And in fact, um, some of them are already producing um, items in Europe where they're at 100% recycled content. Um, and so it's like really amazing that um, that this is, uh, a, that, that there was that things are a little further along than I even knew. Um, so this will be cleaning care, like for example, um, laundry detergent. Well, it turns out that Procter and Gamble, and I didn't, I learned this too in the last, um, in the last short period of time, Procter and Gamble controls 55% of the laundry detergent in the US. Tide is one of their products. It's amazing. I had no idea. And of course, seventh generation, which we actually use is, um, is also, I can't remember one of the major corporations, but it's one of the major co corporations um, uh, is Procter, is uh, Tide and, and their other products. So what I'm, the point of this, what I'm trying to say is that this is good because it's codifying what they say they're gonna do and it makes it so it's real. And then they, and there, and there is off ramps in case they, um, they can't get enough supply of the recycled content resin, but this is gonna be a really terrific um, up, a benefit for our recycling system to bring value to these pro to these items to recycle them. Because there are parts of Washington right now that will not recycle these. They've said, nope, no more, won't recycle these. So this would make that more, um, bring, us, bring us back to that. Okay, now I'm like losing my math. Okay, here we go. Okay, now the last piece of recycled content is trash bags. California has a law that's been in place since the 1980s 
Um, it's only 10%, but, but we're going better here. So we have 10, 15, and then 20%. Um, and New Jersey has a law where they're working on this at the same time. And they, um, I think the New Jersey law will actually probably pass. So this will help bring value to film because as you all know, film is a very frustrating thing for people. Your recycling system doesn't want it because it wraps around and hurts their equipment and contaminates their other materials. And so people have to take it back to the store and a lot of the stores said no because of COVID. And so it's like, so this film is like, wrap and film is like a big old problem for most people. We all are upset about that. Okay, now um, I'm gonna move on to, an, well, let me pause and see if there are any questions about that bill before we move on to other bills or thoughts. Okay, great. Okay, um, so another bill that we're working on is a bill to allow, um, this is Skylar Rood, his bill. Um, and he's a Republican, so this is a bipartisan bill, um, to um, allow, instead of using recycled paper, um, uh, recycled wood fiber in paper bags, to allow wheat straw. Now, initially I was like, wheat straw, no way, we want to help the recycling system, but then I learned about it. And what the deal is, is that in Southern Washington, after they've harvested the wheat, they, um, they often burn it. And this creates black carbon going up in the air. So this is a huge public health issue. And it's also just burning up the resource. So it, there is a pulp facility down in Southern Washington that is now um, making wheat straw pulp and they are now making bags. And so the idea is to be able to make um, various types of bags um, and, and it won't be too much of an of a impact on the recycling system because it will be at relatively small levels. So that feels- uh, Wait, what, what, what were we looking at there? Was that the wheat burning? Yeah, they burn the wheat at the end of the harvest. Okay. The wheat straw, the wheat straw, the waste wheat straw. So this is making value out of that waste. Okay, now another bill that I think is also gonna do very well is um, a bill that is about coordinating your industrial waste. So this is um, from a town in Denmark and um, I went on a tour two years ago with I Sustain and it was so cool. So this isn't that big of a village. And what they've done is all, they've, they've created this very purposefully. They're, they're manufacturing things and they're doing things and they're sharing water and energy and materials throughout the whole system so that you can really reuse everything and create almost a closed loop, but certainly a really great synergy of using the different materials. Um, oops, I guess I don't know the photo again. Anyway, so this would be great here in Washington. We really need this. Um, why are we doing, why, so what, when I was on that tour, so one of the speakers said, if I ever see um, steam or heat coming out of the top of a smokestack, I see that as a waste. We should be using all the energy coming out of a smokestack and putting it back into using that heat for other things. Now, granted, you have to be careful with that, but it's like, you know, we doing synergy is like, sort of like a common sense thing. Now it will, this would uh, uh, authorize commerce to work on this and to provide grants for it. Um, it doesn't say it's going to happen for sure, but it will basically motivate this. Now, another bill that, um, that like I said, started in November is, this was Strom Peterson's bill. This is just a, the bill this year is HB 1161. And this is doing some modifications on that. It's allowing more than one producer. The original bill only had one producer and it also is making some fixes in it. So I'm just being complete by showing you these bills. Um, this is not that big a deal bill and I'm sure it'll go right through. Um, and then um, another bill that actually was heard this morning, I testified on it, um, is by Sharon Shoemake. Um, and this is to delay the implementation of the um, certain dates for the um, solar panel recycling bill. Now, um, we would not like it to be delayed, but we understand why it's being delayed. So we're, we're basically in support of it. Um, because we do want to have effective recycling of the solar panels and there does need to be a little bit more work to figure it out. So I, you can ask me questions about that. It's a complicated situation. Now, this is my favorite bill, my favorite bill. I love this bill and it's died for the session. Um, so this is Representative Mia Gregerson who was just terrific. She's quite a fighter and she took over this bill this year. It's called Right to Repair and it's part of an international movement of trying to get right to repairs done across the world and, in, and of course in the United States. And um, what it says is that for devices that have a screen and are older than five years old, the original manufacturers like HP and Apple and Microsoft have to provide the specs, the tools and the parts at cost to the um, repair, little independent repair shops and to the public. 
And the advantage of this is that um, A, you get, we get a lot more stuff repaired instead of tossed um, and you, that creates um, more jobs. And then from Representative Gregerson's perspective, this is all about equity. She wants to have, did she, what a large part of her platform is digital access across the state, um, especially in relation to COVID um, for students and others to have access to devices. And so she sees this as refurbishing devices and getting that. And then lastly, from a climate change perspective, um, this, I love this, this is from US Perg. They did a calculation that if everyone in the Washington held on to their cell phones um, for one more year, and of course with COVID, you probably haven't done too much damage to your cell phone because um, you haven't gone around and thrown them on the ground like I normally do. And, um, and that, that it would make a huge difference in terms of greenhouse gases, the equivalent of taking um, over 14,000 cars off the road for a year. That bill died, that bill died um, a, for, several weeks ago, um, but it did really well. And I think it's sending a message to industry, you know, it's getting very close. Washington almost got out of committee and, other, and there's 20 other states or 19 other states where this bill has been introduced. There's a lot of public sentiment in favor of this. But of course, being a state that has Microsoft um, as a very dominant power, it's hard to do it here. Now, this bill is about um, looking at, I talked about food waste earlier. So this again is Senator Doss. And the idea is to do a bill, not now, but next year, that's like California's bill, where they're working to get organic waste out of the landfill. And the reasoning is climate change. And so this bill here, this bill that was introduced this year, this was not intended to um, pass. The idea was to get the conversation started. And I've heard that it will get a courtesy hearing, but I'm not sure it actually will. But it's not meant to pass this year, but to actually work this summer and come up with um, some great language for a bill for next year. And this bill that passed in California originally, actually in 2014, um, is a big deal, really big deal. Um, it, it's making a huge difference in expanding infrastructure for compost and for uh, anaerobic digestion and for other uses of um, organic waste and not letting it go to the landfill. So you can see the target here is a pretty strict target. It's saying that the organic waste to the landfill has to be reduced by 50% by this year, 2020, and 75% by 2025. So that's the kind of thing we want to set. And then or, and edible food is at its own target. This is the kind of thing we want to do for Washington, for sure. Um, OK, let's talk about next year. So next year, we are looking at a big bill, an omnibus bill on, um, on packaging that might be a pure product stewardship bill, or it might be a modified bill um, to look at how we can um, address our um, recycling system in Washington. Um, what the ideal scenario would be that the manufacturers and the brand owners pay for the end of life of the packaging and pro products. And this is based largely, but not entirely off of Recycle BC. So you all are close to B um, BC and before COVID you went up there a lot, I bet. And you may have noticed that they have a um, very strong recycling systems up there and they have a 75 in 2017 they had a 75% recovery rate of their packaging. So that is both a little bit of incineration, but also um, uh, recycling. And um, so we would like to get our numbers up a lot higher and a model like BC might not be so bad. Um, this is where we've had these kind of laws passed around the world. Um, this is from a, a work session that occurred in December at our legislature, a map from that. And um, it shows the um, places in the world where you have these kind of laws already in place. It's a big deal, it's a heavy lift. And you know we probably would not get a pure program here. Um, and the idea is that you shift the, um, the cost from the rate payer to the manufacturers. So now let us, let me pause before I go into the last section of the talk. See if there are any questions or anything. Okay, we're doing great on time. Um, all right, so um, let us talk about other solutions. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and this is something that we have been partnering with resources already and would like to continue, um, which is doing litter assessments. So we wanna look at um, trash as a water pollutant. And that's something you can do under the Clean Water Act um, as part of the 303D listing. And you can see the states and, and Washington DC where this has already occurred. So what we're doing is we're helping support local groups that are doing, um, litter cleanups, but we're assessing the litter in detail so we can actually compare 
the um, types of litter and the quantities from different locations all around the state. So if you do any litter cleanup, if you're part of any litter cleanup groups, let me know because we would love to come work with you. It's just like once a year, once every couple of years um, to actually quantify your litter in a more rigorous way. So we actually look at every little piece of litter. We, we mark out an area and only do that part for the actual detailed assessment. Now, another thing that is very exciting is, and this took several years of work, um, on October 13th, the Board of Health voted this in. So this is the Department of Health for the state. They have food safety regulations, and this is bringing your own container for food containers. Um, and this, this is the language in the new food safety code that will allow people to bring their own container for food. And here it is for beverages, allowing people to bring their own container for beverages. And um, this is super exciting because um, right now it's actually illegal for people to bring their own container for food. Um, like when you're going into a, a food co-op, uh, uh, like a grocery store that has um, a bulk session, things like that. And also for coffee, you could do it if you didn't have any cream because um, cream is considered a time temperature control. There could be, um, if it got to, if it had the wrong temperature and it, it was handled incorrectly, it would be a safety problem. So this will all be shifting, but it won't be shifting until March, 2022. And it's, so it's not gonna go into effect until March of 2022. And the reason for that is because the restaurant association said, you know, even though this isn't, we don't oppose this, we are under such stress right now, we don't need any more regulations. Um, they need to get out of COVID first. Now let's talk about false solutions for a second. So there's a lot of push to do waste to energy. We are adamantly opposed to this. So it's a fancy way of saying incineration. We are adamantly opposed to this. And the reasons we're opposed to it is because of environmental justice issues, cost issues, and that it would decimate our recycling system. And let me give you a really great example. So this is a relatively new waste to energy facility that was built in, Hon in um, Honolulu. And um, it, it basically um, requires in their contract that Honolulu has to send 800,000 tons per year of trash to this facility, or they face steep penalties, financial penalties. And when COVID hit, and as you can see the date of this, April 25th, what happened is, is that without any tourists, they didn't have enough trash and they were about to have huge fines that would add up into the millions. And um, because they didn't have enough waste to feed the furnace, essentially. And so um, the governor actually ended up giving them a waiver. They didn't have to pay the fines but because of the COVID. But it is this is the thing. If you build one of these facilities, you got to feed it. And we're trying to do waste reduction. We don't want to feed the beast. We want to have waste reduction. Um, this is the facility, a brand new waste energy facility in Copenhagen, which has won all sorts of awards because it actually has a ski Live, a ski lift. So this is the bottom. I went there when it was still being constructed, but this is going to have snow on it or even this fake grass. And you could basically come down, ski from the top all the way down. So it's pretty cool, but it's right in the middle of Copenhagen. And um, when we were on this tour, as we we're going around the country, we kept hearing people say, well, actually, we don't want to do this anymore. We want to stop doing incineration of the plastic waste. And so it was very interesting to have a brand new facility that just got built but at the same time, all the speakers who were all solid waste professionals telling us all over the tour how they want to stop doing this. And the reason is because see all that um, emission coming out of the top, that is mostly not, it's mostly steam. But the problem is it's a huge volume of material and there's a very small percentage, but it's still a percentage it adds up of things like dioxin and other toxic chemicals. Now, um, chemical recycling is now being pushed as another solution for our plastics crisis. Um, and this is a facility that broke ground in Indiana. And we are kind of like the jury is out on chemical recycling. Um, Gaia last year um, published this report, which is an excellent report. I, re I definitely commend this to you. Um, because the thing is, is that the, um, the technologies, which they've been doing for decades, they've been trying to do this for decades, where you take a plastic back down to its molecular level and then then bring it back up into the same plastic again, in theory is a very good thing. And they can do it in the lab, but they have a lot of trouble doing it in a commercial scale. And we're very concerned about toxic emissions and we're very concerned about greenhouse gas, how much energy it takes. So um, my personal feeling is it's we're not there yet on chemical recycling. We don't wanna like codify it, but down the line, there might be some technologies that are actually okay. So. Um, 
it's kind of a mixed bag, I guess. So in conclusion, um, we advocate for prevention as number one, bring your own bag, bring your own thermos, then reuse, then recycling. We're not keen on recovery, which is another word, way of saying incineration. And we're definitely not wanting to send things to landfill. And that is the end and I will stop sharing. Okay. Liz, do you have anything to add? You've been in the thick of the bill, so you can have things to say about the bill. <laughs> no, I'm, I was actually, I didn't, I missed the hearing today. Um, ah. and I was hoping to get some, some insight because I have to give a very similar presentation in like half an hour. So I was Oh, good. Well, I guess I've given you a lot of good info. The hearing went well today. Um, awesome. There were 42 people signed up to testify. And so he only got through, he has 15 people that are going to carry the hearing over till tomorrow. And there were definitely people who were unhappy with styrofoam ban. So Dart, Dart is very unhappy with the styrofoam ban. And there were other people who um, were, the, were unhappy with the fact that we have the um, personal care and cleaning products. So those were kind of expected um, concerns that we, that we, we kind of expected. So they're having a second hearing tomorrow? Well, yeah. So he's carrying it over into a second day, which he does. I've seen him do this before. So he's going to let those last 15 people testify tomorrow if they show up, because they may have a conflict tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Overall, yeah. you think like? Well, overall, overall, it's exactly what we expected. We knew there were still some concerns and those concerns were voiced. So I would say that it wasn't like everyone saying, kumbaya, we're all done. It was definitely like, okay, we have these concerns. We have those concerns. I mean, that was, that was definitely expected. So no surprises. So does anyone have any um, other questions or thoughts? Well, I, I, I asked in the chat and I also am very curious about the Scandinavian model that you make, that you pointed to. Um, my understanding is that a lot of what's happening up there is from the ground up, new construction that they can build direct um, d direct kinds of feedback and, and systems when they're building from ground up. Retrofitting, on the other hand, much more of a challenge. And that's I, so much of what we're facing here. You are completely right. Um, however, if we are able to, for example, build out our um, composting infrastructure, they could co-locate things at, um, land, at, at um, transfer stations and landfills. So that would be building new facilities and doing the co-working. Um, but you're right, it is definitely about um, either like a major retrofit of, of a site, which is actually what's going on out in Grays Harbor, Grays Harbor, or near Grays Harbor. So there is, a, there is an industrial symbiosis effort going in, not Grays Harbor, but another coastal area that's industrial. So they're taking an old facility and they're retrofitting the entire facility into new uses where they're going to have that, some of that synergy going. Nice. But you're right, it's very hard to just take a... Um, take a, an existing smokestack and like all of a sudden do good things with it. Well, and, and in fact, the, the uh, another bill that didn't get out of committee this, this year was the one that said, you know, no natural gas in new buildings. Uh, right. And that's really sad that 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 didn't didn't carry weight because that's what it's going to take is at least getting the new buildings to to, to stop using gas or that's fossil right. fuels. Yep, that's right. That's right. Oh, I let Destiny fell out. I've got to admit her. <laughs> I've become host all of a sudden. Um, well, um, any other questions or comments from anyone? Thank you all very much for attending. I think Destiny, we're, whoops, she's not there yet. We're, we're, I think we're winding down. Oh, okay, I am so sorry. My internet just completely went down. I don't know what happened. Yeah, no worries. Okay. And we brought you back in. <laughs> all right, we're good. We're good. Yeah. Um, well, did folks have any more questions? Well, not a question, but again, I, I want to really thank Heather uh, and Zero Waste Washington for um, excellent leadership in this field. It's a very inspiring and, and helpful to know that you're out there. So blessings. Well, thank you very much. And I have to say, this is only with partners. We are teeny sure. weeny. So it's a partnership effort. And um, and all of you, I mean, we people say, how can you do this? We're like, only because we have partners. <laughs> so well, we yeah. need... We yeah, need you re all. <laughs> resources has been fantastic. And I love I'm a, resources. I'm a, uh, a yeah. master composter and recycler from the WSU program, and uh, it's uh, it's an uphill uphill struggle, but um, um, it's great to have colleagues in the in the effort. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know, with Zoom, we can now connect even better. Yeah. Um, it's it, honestly, I think there's some big good things coming out of COVID in this regard. Oh yeah, I've learned a lot from these Zoom chats. Yeah. And resources yeah. is sponsored. Let's keep doing them on Zoom, right? Yeah, yeah you bet. Yeah. Mostly, what books people read from, like what's in the background. That's always. Good. 
That's true. <laughs> I, I just want a second, like, we have some amazing partners that we work with, um, but I will, I'm just going to push that, like, Heather does more than her fair share of the work, so I just want to give her a huge shout out, because she is just tireless and relentless. Yeah, and yeah but couldn't do it without the whole thing, and and there's the inside game, and there's the outside game, and we, 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 the outside game is critical. By that, you mean the, I mean the grassroots, the talking to your legislators, I mean, there's just no question um, that that is what has to happen. To get anything passed, and you know, the on the on the um, bill that you mentioned, I you know it it did okay. It it may do fine next year. You know, what I mean, you're, it it does take a couple years sometimes for things. We'll see, we'll see. It was a tough year. This year is a tough year because they winnowed things a little more strongly than they normally do too. So well, we'll uh, it's self-serving, but I should mention that I've produced a a, a slideshow myself of. Uh, Plastic Pollution and the Path to Solutions that highlights a number of the organizations uh, nationally and internationally that are working on this issue, especially uh, ocean cleanup. And, right. uh, and I, I do this for groups, and especially since the Zoom, I used to do it, bef you know, have to take a little projector to a, a place and, ah, you know, you never know what kind of setting you're going to be in. But now on Zoom, it works great. So I'm, I'm available to... Uh, to do that, my email is in the chat now, and uh, I, I like to do that for any groups that are interested. I've done it for the Audubon Society, for instance, and their their connection with birds, and bird bird uh, effect, the effects on birds of uh, um, uh, shore pollution and such. And uh, so I, I, I'm I'm passionate about that and uh, try to educate people as much as I can as a master composter and recycler. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, um, I think we're probably um, winding down. Destiny, do you have any final yes. closing? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Heather, for that presentation. That was awesome. That was, I always like when a presentation is really informative and also leaves me like mildly horrified. And the entire time I was just like, oh my goodness, especially like the, what is it? The one pound of plastic for every three pounds of biomass is insane, but I think it really illustrates the urgency of this. So I echo um, their thanks for your work. Thank you for your work on this. This is awesome. Um, and, and Heather, I, I would say, I would also admit that I, I took a number of screenshot, screenshots of your slides. Okay, great. Uh, I'm hoping that I might be able to, uh, um, with credit, um, utilize them in some of my productions. That's fine, that's fine. Um, no problem, yeah. Hey, listen, I've got a six o'clock that I've okay. got to go to, so I'm gonna boogie out of here. Um, and uh, thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. All right, bye, bye. Yes, all, thank you all for joining us. And again, if you um, were also mildly horrified like I was, and you're like, I need to show this, or you just wanna rewatch it and take all that in, it is gonna be recorded and available on our resources YouTube page. And if you're a North Sound Stewards, it'll be out in the next North Sound Stewards E! News. So you can watch it again and show all your friends and be like, look. Um, yeah, but again, thank you all for joining and just make sure that if you're a steward, you put these in your hours and we will see you next time. So you guys have a good evening. Bye.